So welcome. Uh, my name is Andrea Poli. I'm a member of Sarah Santa Fe, your host for this laser. Lasers are Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. They happen all around the world. And Sire Santa Fe is the Santa Fe slash New Mexico slash parts of Colorado host for official host for lasers. And with us. Um, this is actually, believe it or not, our first laser of the year. The last one we had was at Vladim uh, in December. So we are so honored and excited to be hosting our show. Uh, well, I will focus in a minute. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about Sire at Santa Fe, we promote excellence in arts science, and that intersection that we call Sire. Uh, lasers are only one way we do that. We also host uh, gatherings, field trips out to important places around town and uh, beyond. And, um, and we have exhibitions. Uh, we have general, general support from the NEA, from the Mexico Arts and the Mexico Humanities Council from individuals in our community, and of course our great partner, Meow Wolf, at Rainbow Rainbow Room. Uh, you can find out about our upcoming programs at sayartsantafe.org. Um, coming up, uh, so do sign up for our newsletter because coming up at the end of June through July, we have a series of events and uh, exhibitions called Into the Realms of Possibility that are gonna be happening in Los Alamos. Um, and we are co-hosting an amazing event that Richard there, Richard, <laughs> talk to Richard <laughs> about an amazing event starting the end of July um, in Telluride and online. Um, it's pretty incredible. incredible. Um, and if you are inclined to the irrational, um, if you go to sirensantafe.org, you can click on support arts science and join us by buying a piece of pie for $3.14. I want one five two. Oh, I, I need to talk to you. <laughs> so um, we are so honored um, to catch Marco Bongiorno Nardelli. Um, he has a. If I was going to say all his bio, it would take forever. So I'm just going to do the short one. Um, Marco Bongiorno uh, Nardelli is a Regents Professor of Physics and Composition at the University of Rhode Texas and external faculty at the Santa Fe Institute, which is why we were able to get him here, um, where he leads an initiative on music complexity. Uh, he's a composer, flutist, and computational physicist, and a fellow of the American Physical Society and of the Institute of Physics, and a Parma recording artist. An incredible mixture of that, blending of that art and science that we love. Um, his most recent work, uh, which looks incredible, is going to be at Currents uh, uh, June, which is going to be happening here in town on uh, June 14th through 23rd. So I, without any further delay, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our site Santa Fe and Miao Wall for hosting this event. And uh, thank you all for coming. So, uh, music for Martians. Let me start with a story here that many of you know, but I mean, you know, it's kind of open a little bit uh, the stage for what I'm going to say. So in September 5th, 1977, uh, uh, the Voyager was sent into space uh, as a probe for outer space, actually. It was supposed to probe only the solar system, then it went out of the solar system. It's still going strong. They had to kind of fix it a little bit. Uh, uh, a few weeks ago, but now apparently it's back, so everything is working fine. And I mean, he passed all the big planets and, and things. And uh, um, what actually I want to uh, make you know here in this picture, there are these two technicians that are installing this disc. Yes. In this disc uh, that is actually made of gold, uh, there are recordings uh, of sounds and recordings of music. It's actually supposed to be a way to send uh, you know, human, a, a, a signature of human civilization into uh, outer space that maybe sometimes in uh, the you know, next few uh, years somebody will find it and you know, figure out what is on this disk. And uh, besides uh, uh, you know, the natural sound and mind-made sounds, 
this is the list of the uh, music that is record record that is uh, inscribed uh, into this disc. I believe they, it's basically like a vinyl, but made of gold. Uh, and you can see a lot of different kind of, uh, of uh, music from different traditions. Uh, there is an overwhelming uh, majority of Bach and Beethoven stuff, of course, <laughs> because uh, you know it's Western uh, music and so we are embedded into it. Huh? And anyway, it's still going up there. Um, we'll see what happens. So let's make an hypo hypothesis. Let's suppose that at a certain point uh, it gets intercepted by a civilization that has a deep knowledge of math, physics, and data structure. And that was a dynamical system, so basically people that could come out of the SFI of uh, uh, some other galaxy, but they completely lack any understanding of music, or I mean, they they don't have. I mean, completely different from from human civilization, where every culture has a musical tradition. These guys they don't know. Anything. So they get this disc. And they, they're very smart, so they want to figure out if this, this means something. And in a way, my question is, can they, by looking at the data that we put in this disk, appreciate the aesthetics of music? Okay. This is kind of preamble of my talk. So we start with data. Uh, I know that some of you are very familiar with no data structure representations, but now I wear my kind of physics professor hat and I tell you a little bit about the data and the way in which I look at the data and how this relates to the music. So we are used to data in many different forms. One of the most important things that we think about when we think about data is how we represent the data so that we can make sense of it. We all went through the pandemic uh, a few years ago where we were bombarded by data and visualization of data. So you can represent data in many different ways. The way I want to represent data, though, is as a network. So this is the network of airports in the United States. I mean, this is an old picture, but it's probably still valid. And uh, as you can see, you have uh, data points that are the different airports. You have connection between data points. So this is a representation of an interaction. You know, what is the interaction between the different airports that is mediated by the different flight uh, uh, paths uh, between one airport and the other. What we see here also is that it seems that some airports are more important than others. <laughs> so you see how the, the red is concentrated around Salt Lake City, Minneapolis, Detroit. This is, I think, Delta the big hub here is in Atlanta. And remember this word hub but because this is coming back. So it, this is a way of representing interaction between data points uh, through uh, things that we call, I mean, a representation, a graph where we have data as uh, nodes of this graph and connection between these nodes as links, uh, in this case, the different routes uh, that the airplanes can take. Now, this is a network. And network is a term that, that you probably have heard uh, an infinite amount of time. Uh, uh, time so. And networks uh, are everywhere in, in, in our lives. I mean, there are technological networks like you know, communication systems, the internet, the phone lines, the, the electrical grid, the water systems, and so on. Right? Uh, this side of the screen. There are biological and ecological network. If you want to know more, ask Andre over there. <laughs> uh, economic networks, uh, you know, transactions. I mean, this, it, 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 all this information uh, uh, can be represented uh, uh, through graphs. So the, this representation is very powerful because it gives us not only a visual way of making sense of this data, but also uh, elucidates the interaction between these data. Yeah, uh, social networks, <coughs> Facebook, X, uh, uh, TikTok, Instagram, these are all uh, networks. And then I mentioned cultural networks. In this case, uh, uh, I list mostly uh, languages and semantic families. Uh, and I would 
what I want to add to this list, uh, probably in this cultural network uh, subset uh, music, and we'll see how we can use, do this uh, in, in a way that is meaningful. So, I said networks uh, uh, provide us with a way of representing data and interactions, uh, um, and uh, they give us quantitative measures. I mean, we can use these representations and get information uh, that are uh, uh, important to uh, understand the behavior of this data. And uh, I don't, I, I will not go into the math of this at all, but um, there are two uh, uh, important uh, quantities or measures uh, that uh, uh, I want you to kind of grasp uh, a little bit. The first one is uh, what we call the degree uh, or the degree distribution of the network. So suppose that we are looking at this uh, picture again. When I said there are some uh, airports that are more important uh, because they look more red, uh, they look more red because they have more links going into them. And so if I count how many connections these nodes have, uh, I get what is called the degree of this node. And looking at how the degree of all the nodes of this network are distributed uh, tells us something about the behavior of the data system, of this, the system itself. Really. Why, um, for instance, uh, some networks are resistant uh, to you know, the breakage of leads, so the, the, you still can navigate to the US even if one of these connections is broken. The other uh, aspect of uh, networks that I, uh, I will be using in the next uh, uh, half an hour or 40 minutes uh, is what I call in general the community structure of the network. So, um, in general, uh, in a network representation, a graph representation, nodes uh, can form uh, uh, groups. So there are nodes that are closer to each other than any other nodes in this network. They form islands, or they form uh, you know, more connected uh, um, regions. And these are communities. And in general, communities share some common characteristics. And uh, this is uh, also a measure uh, that I will be using uh, when uh, uh, I will start talking about uh, um, music methods. Just to give you a sense of this community uh, uh, thing, this is uh, an image from, uh, I mean, this is my Facebook network uh, probably 10 years ago. Now Facebook doesn't allow you to download the data to, be, to build these kind of networks. But you see that there are, you know, islands, there are groups of friends here. And, and if I look at the pictures uh, of each individual group, so, um, I can tell you, that, you know, these are my, my music, musician friends, all the music people I know, or I used to know at that time. These are all my physicist friends. Uh, these are Italians and family. And so by doing uh, some algorithmic uh, uh, evaluation mm -hmm. of the network structure of the network, I can extract this kind of information without giving any prior knowledge uh, to the system. So this is something that comes out uh, from some mathematical manipulation of the network structure that I don't want to talk about uh, and we put many equations, uh, so we'll skip that. But what I want to uh, point out here is that by using these mathematical techniques uh, uh, that are mediated from, from some a field of physics that is, is called uh, statistical mechanics, uh, um, we can uh, actually have a complete, re I mean, a very rich representation and understanding of the data um, uh, just by looking at the structures. If you have any questions at any point, please ask. Okay, what uh, the, this has to do with music? Well, my point is that music is data. So if it's data, then it should be possible to represent it as a data system. That means I should be able to do networks on musical spaces. Musical spaces can be, you know, many. I will be focusing here mostly on the Western classical music tradition, but what I'm gonna say on the rest of this presentation is valid for any music tradition all over the world. It's just a matter of uh, defining uh, 
the, 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 the structural component that you want to work with. Okay, so if we are in this kind of uh, space uh, or spaces, uh, we can look at the melody, we can look at the harmony, rhythm, orchestration, timbre, all this uh, can be actually represented uh, as a data system. And in uh, uh, what follows, uh, um, I will be mostly concerned uh, with the uh, uh, networks uh, of harmony, that means how chords uh, uh, are connected and can be connected. Uh, but in general, a structural view of uh, music based on uh, a 12 tone temperament, uh, equal temperament system of 12 uh, pitches. So, the zero order constituent of all this uh, is pitch. In our Western music tradition, we have 12 pitches that form the chromatic scale. You can see it here, we call it with different names, depending on where we are from, we are from Europe, or, or Italy, or France, or Germany, or the US. Um, the important thing here is that uh, we can always represent these different pitches uh, uh, with a number. And this is at the core of this representation that I want to talk about, uh, because we, uh, we have to kind of translate uh, this uh, um, kind of musical information into something that we can manipulate mathematically. So, we have 12 pitches. Uh, um, what can we do with these 12 pitches? Well, if we take an approach like uh, the Library of Babel by Robin Luis Borges, you can just combine them in all possible ways and see if by one of these combinations you get, I don't know, the Ninth Symphony, but they have the Ninth Symphony, or whatever, or last uh, uh, Taylor Swift uh, hit. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, in this, uh, you know, from foundational, I think, mean, now uh, the short story of Boris, uh, what he does uh, is he, he kind of imagines this infinite library where there are books that contain all the possible combinations of all the possible letters. And uh, in a way, uh, um, one of the things that I wanted to do when I started uh, to work on these ideas and projects was to kind of make something similar to this infinite library, but reducing it uh, uh, in a manageable way. You've co of course, uh, in, in, in terms of letters uh, and, and, and words, is the, the, the combination is way, uh, way more than uh, like for 12 pitches and different chords you can make with 12 pitches. But you, can, you will see in, uh, uh, in, in a few seconds uh, how this uh, uh, possible space that you can build uh, is actually very large. So we start uh, by defining a harmony space. Uh, where harmony means uh, uh, a combination, simultaneous playing of two different pitches, a chord. You have you know, starting from unison, one single pitch to a 12-note uh, chord, 12 note chord uh, with all the chromatic, uh, the, the, the notes of the chromatic scale. Now, let's start to um, uh, reduce this number of combinations in some way by saying that uh, we don't consider duplicate notes. So if I have a C at, at one octave and C an octave higher, this is C and that's it. We don't, I'm not, I'm, uh, basically I'm using this approach of uh, contemporary music theory or set theory where, where we define uh, uh, a speech class as all the C's that you can hear, basically. But that's just one uh, entry in this uh, uh, um, larger. Uh, answer. Well, so if you start with 12 note, uh, like in the chromatic scale, uh, and you build all the possible combination of chords from 1 to 12, uh, you get 4,000 different, uh, 4,096 different chords. If you double the note space, uh, so now you, instead of considering the chromatic scale with uh, flats uh, and, uh, and sharps, uh, you actually start to uh, you, you introduce uh, quarter tones, so uh, alterations between uh, a note and a, 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 within a semitone, uh, then you get 16.7 million. If you take the whole keyboard of a piano that is 88 keys, uh, then you have 10 to the 26 different chords that you can play on uh, the keyboard without repetitions of the same note. So 
way more intensive. So 10 to the 76 uh, is like a chemistry number, right? And you have the Avogadro number, the number of atoms per cubic centimeter is 10 to 24, I think. So, I mean, it's like very big. <laughs> okay, so how can we make sense of this big harmony space? Huh? Let's focus on the 12 tone system and uh, uh, build a geometric model of this harmonic space. So, as I told you at the beginning, uh, uh, I can represent each pitch by a number, and so each chord here is represented by, I don't know, a triad, uh, three numbers, uh, or four numbers, uh, or two numbers, or six numbers, and uh, um, in mathematical terms, uh, I call these vectors. <coughs> this is a particular vector in a space uh, of uh, 12 pitches. And, uh, um, and using geometry, I can actually build uh, a, 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 a measure of distance between chords uh, using Pythagoras theorem. Probably all of you are familiar with at least from middle school. Um, so I can define uh, a space of vectors uh, with a metric, uh, a distance, uh, uh, that is all based uh, on this chromatic scale of uh, 12 pitches. And what I can do is I can assign uh, the chords uh, to be the nodes of my network. And the edges, uh, so the links uh, between the nodes, uh, are defined by their distance. So if the distance is smaller than something, then there is a link. If it's larger, there is no link between these two chords. Now, this becomes anyway complicated uh, and, 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 and um, um, you know, very rich. Uh, this is a representation of a music, uh, of a, a chord network. Uh, this is not for 12 pitches, this is for 24. And each dot that you see here, it's a chord. Uh, and chords are connected only if the distance between one chord and the next uh, is one. That means that there is only a quarter, so half a semitone, uh, distance uh, between all the pitches of one chord and all the pitches of the other. So, you know, it's kind of very uh, interesting representation graphically of this uh, kind of space. But we can do things, uh, I mean, we have to reduce this so that, that things become a little bit more manageable. So we go back to the um, uh, 12 pitches of the chromatic scale, and now we build these networks uh, between uh, chords of three notes, uh, these are the triads. Triads are the foundation of music theory and harmony in, uh, in Western classical music. And so these are very, you know, some of these are very familiar chords, so the major chords, the minor chords, the augmented chords, the diminished chords, and so on. And this is, these are maps uh, of, that show how uh, this geometrical space uh, is built uh, or emerges from uh, the, uh, the distances uh, um, that we choose. So these are the, this is the network for distance one, this is the, this the, net, the two uh, networks for distance two, for two, and so on. And these are important geometrical representations that actually tell us something as composer of, for instance, uh, which path in a chord progression uh, you might want to take uh, to go from one point to the next. So these are maps, uh, in a way, of uh, this space uh, of uh, all the possible combination of chords. Um, I mean, I just want to show you this picture. <laughs> yes. So this is, it's a very, this one is a kind of a technical thing. I mean, uh, some of you might be familiar with the um, atonal music, uh, you know, Schoenberg, Weber, Berg, uh, that it's based on this idea of the, 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 the row of 12 tones uh, that are used to build the composition using permutations and combinations uh, that are very well defined. This is a, a paper that I published recently on perspective of new music where I do this red row representation for these tone rows uh, and show how these tone rows are all connected uh, throughout the space uh, of pitch. All right, so this is like a very broad view of this geometrical space built on uh, these 12 uh, numbers, these 12 pitches. So it's very rich, as you can see. But it's not yet a composition. This is not music. This is the under, an underlying 
space or the device structure where we move around in order to find the combinations that then become our compositions and our music. So there is a step that we need to do, and there is a step that I call the, from the synthetic networks to the complex networks. What does it mean? What I showed you so far are networks that are completely deterministic. They are whatever is there, they are always be the same, and it's very well defined what they are. A composer doesn't do that. The composer picks and chooses different parts from here and there. So basically what happens uh, is that you introduce complexity, where complexity in this sense means uh, combining individual agents into something that is a composition, so it's broader than just a part that you are taking from it. And this I will show you how uh, kind of opens up a lot of possibilities for <coughs> analysis and composition. So, we start from a chorale by Johann Sebastian Bach. This is from the cantata number, I don't remember, it's BW366. And what you are seeing here is the network representation of this chorale. And you can actually follow what happens in the video. basically kind of binds together groups of nodes uh, because of their geometrical properties. And I don't know if you, uh, if you heard it or noticed, but yeah, yeah, these yeah, different yeah. colors correspond to three different keys in which this coral is built. So you'll start from uh, uh, E ma ma major, go to F sharp minor, and then F sharp major over there. And, and you hear it, you hear it when it's over here, and then it goes over there, and then it goes over there. And this is something that I didn't put in, in this. I mean, they, they, it's all derived from uh, this representation in terms of networks. On top of that, you can analyze the way in which uh, you move from one core to the other, statistically, but that's something that, I mean, if you are interested, you can talk about it, but not in this uh, particular way. So, this is kind of an illustration. Now, what I want to show you is what kind of information we can gain from this kind of representation and how we can use this, or I can use this at least, I do use it in a compositional process. So, what I'm going to talk now is the tonal harmony and the route optimization problem. So we skip to Beethoven, because we go back and forth, back Beethoven, we go back, and this is like music theory. Um, and we looked at one of the string quartets, one of the latest uh, ones. Uh, and this uh, actually is an, is an illustration of how I build these networks. So this is the score. The score is looked at vertically. Each chord uh, in the score is identified uh, as a vector. And then each vector is placed into the network with a particular importance. So I call this the score network. Now is the time. It's the time to look back at uh, what are the characteristics of these <coughs> networks, because then is kind of this is what leads me to uh, the, the the compositional aspect. So 
This is a network that characterized by uh, four broad properties. One is uh, a particular degree distribution of the nodes. You see that some nodes are very big and then many others are smaller. This is a similar structure to the airport hub network. These big nodes are actually called hubs. And uh, um, this kind of degree distribution is uh, uh, what uh, makes uh, this a uh, scale-free network. Meaning, I mean, in terms of the statistical mechanics of these things, is uh, uh, if this was uh, were to be a very, 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 very large network with millions of nodes, uh, that is not the case here, but if it were to be millions of nodes, then every environment would have shown the same kind of geometrical characteristics. It's like, mm -hmm. in a way, I mean, if you were fractals, it's kind of a fractal, but like in very general terms. Um, but that's not the only thing. There is modularity, so there is this uh, community structure, you know, blue nodes, purple nodes, yellow nodes. Uh, these are particular networks because a music networks are directional, because you go from one core to another, more than from the other core to the previous one, most often. And uh, this structure is kind of reflected at very different uh, you know, scales uh, and, and hierarchies. Well, but now, if you take any book of, to of harmony and you look at the definition of the characteristics of tonal harmony, tonal harmony is governed by a few central chords, the halves. The cur chords occur within a hierarchical structure, so you have modularity in the network or in tonal harmony. You have a segmentic chord progression because it's more likely that you go from a dominant to a tonic than from a tonic to a dominant. Uh, and you can build all this hierarchical structure of all level of composition. So, what I'm saying here uh, is that, in a way, the properties of tonal harmony or tonal harmony emerges uh, as an emerging uh, as a property of the network itself. So that the rules uh, of harmony, the rules that Beethoven in this case were following in his mind, uh, were rules that had that particular structures, and then you can. And connect uh, with uh, the academic uh, uh, kind of teachings of the time. And you can do this for many different uh, uh, <coughs> traditions in a way. I mean, you can do this with the music that doesn't have a tonal structure, you can extract kind of information about the underlying relationship between chords. Okay, so what I showed you before is Static. I take a picture of the whole composition. But music is not static. Music is a time dependent process. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting now to move to a different representation of the same score, but now as a time series. So in this plot here, each dot is the occurrence of a particular chord in time. So I'm kind of go through the score and I see where this chord happens and I add a point. And some chords are repeated, so you see that here you have repetitions of different chords here, 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 and so on. So as a score, as a time series, you have a different set of statistical tools that you can use to analyze the behavior of the time series. Um, and in particular, uh, what I was interested in was uh, a representation that gives me segments uh, so that, that basically I divide this time series uh, into chunks uh, that correspond to se segments that have a particular structure. And when I do that, uh, each segment here can be represented as a network. So that now my string quartet uh, is no more just one shot of a graph. Uh, but it's a series of graphs that correspond to these different regions. Well, also this one is done, done by myself. I mean, this is a particular algorithm that analyzes the structure of the time series and you know, finds places where you can cut the time series and so on. Um, but if you analyze this in depth, uh, you see that uh, you basically um, Get uh, the structure of the sections of the different uh, of the of the quartet in terms of the again the key center 
the key in which that section is written. So, <coughs> now this is just one movement. So this is the, if this, the transition between one key to the next key in the in the piece. And, and you see here, so yeah, so you see here that this is E flat ma um, uh, major, and then you go no, if, if, yeah, E flat e, this is E flat major, and then it goes to G major. And uh, although the chords uh, are the same, uh, the importance is different. So the diameter of this uh, chord, uh, this note, is larger because has a higher note, uh, note degree. And so, again, from this statistical analysis, uh, we can look at the score and identify different regions uh, uh, of different tonality. And this is one of you know, the things that theorists do. You study the piece and then you kind of look at the different transitions. It's a typical exercise for, for a music, music theorist. OK, so this is for the analysis. Uh, Well, I mean, it, it is a chunk of times. So this is a chunk of time. This is a second chunk of time. Third chunk, fourth chunk might be different. Uh, in fact, they are different because uh, uh, you see the sections are different here. So this is kind of the time stamp uh, of the of the piece because because there are longer sections in one key than there are transitional sections uh, or or sections in a in a parallel key or a relative key. So are you accounting for like how long a tone can last or are you just giving each one an even distribution on its sound? In this case, this is evenly distributed. Uh, uh -huh. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, it's not combining this particular example with a rhythmic uh, network, but you can do that. Right. So it can be combined with rhythmic structure. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. So how do we use this? How do we build a composition, I mean a compositional strategy on top of this observation? Well, um, the first observation we can do is that these kind of networks, uh, uh, the score networks, are um, visited by the composer, let's say, um, in a way that every node is, 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 is you, know, go, go, you go through every node every passage between notes so that the composition is built this way. Um, and you can formulate this uh, as an optimization problem in computer science and math. Uh, so you can do this, you can find what is the optimal solution for visiting all the nodes uh, of this network and find out that uh, in short composition like chorales, uh, like this one for instance is another chorale from Bach. Um, but and the optimal solution are very close to each other, not, not surprisingly, because it's very short. Huh? But the idea then is what? The idea is uh, I can build these networks uh, as artificial networks. I can construct networks that have the same kind of uh, um, geometrical structure. They have the same kind of distribution of nodes, for instance, and kind of links. Huh? Um, and then I can assign uh, arbitrarily or with some probability distribution chords to nodes. So now I'm taking a structure that is completely different from the geometrical structure of the Pac Coral I had before, but I'm putting there the same uh, chords uh, with uh, basically assigning chords that have the same degree in one network uh, to the same degree in the other network. So I'm building an artificial kind of core progression by solving the optimization problem of routing uh, through all these nodes uh, and end up with the, with the progression of chords uh, that then I can use to build the product. And so this one is an example of uh, uh, this experiment. You will hear first back um, and then uh, uh, this kind of networks that I've been talking about uh, are called Balabasi Albert networks. And last of all, Basi is a friend of mine who is also a collaborator in this piece that we have at Currents. And I can talk about that a little bit later if you want to. Um, and so the second part, you will be hearing uh, the synthetic uh, chorale made out of this procedure.
I mean, it's maybe Bach would have written that, but as a story, as an evolution that makes sense in musically, it's not disturbing in any way. So, I mean, that's exemplifying a little bit the procedure that, uh, one of the procedures that I use in my composition practice that is based on these ideas and methods but uses a completely different palette of signs and, uh, and pictures. So, uh, it's a little late, I think, so maybe uh, I just want to mention uh, the why I'm here at the Santa Fe Institute um, and give you a little bit of the context. But, um, so I've been, uh, uh, this is actually wrong because the next meeting was last was last year, I'm really sorry. I thought I sent the, the right slides and that they didn't upload me. Um, so we had uh, four meetings of this working group on music complexity. We are a group of uh, very heterogeneous uh, composers, physicists, mathematicians, musicologists, music theorists, uh, psychologists, neuroscientists, uh, people that study cultural evolution. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very broad. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we are creating uh, a an issue of the uh, of a journal on advances in complex systems uh, on uh, music complexity that will come up probably next year. Uh, there are a lot of resources online you can look at uh, um, um, and videos. Uh, and I am also uh, right now recording uh, an online course on music complexity for the Complexity Explorers program. Uh, there is an online uh, um, course program of the Santa Institute that eventually will be available in the free. So uh, if you have time, you just listen to me for, I don't know, 12 units or something. <laughs> well, we are still recording it. So next year, most likely. So uh, if you are, uh, if there are some of you that are more inclined uh, into the mathematics uh, and the, 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 the things, uh, related to you know how we can use this actually from a scientific point of view to infer some information about you know evolution of music for instance. I have a bunch of slides that I will not go through because of time I think unless you really want me to. But um you can also email them too. I can also I mean, it's fine, I can go quick. So the, the whole idea here is to use this kind of representation in terms of networks uh, as uh, uh, to uh, extract uh, uh, quantities that, that we can relate to some macroscopic universal behavior. So in this way, uh, you know, basically what you do, you look at the systems, so look at the ent entropy associated with the systems, and then you extract some sort of measure of complexity if you want to. I mean, I. Let's not go into the equations, but let's look at the results. So this is a representation of uh, this uh, uh, parameter uh, extracted from uh, some measure of entropy, in, uh, entropy information, for uh, the composer between uh, Josquin de Pré, uh, late Renaissance and Mahler, so early modern. Uh, and uh, in principle, this is a, a, a representation of the complexity, the, the measure of complexity of that music in terms of the harmony of that music uh, that uh, has this kind of behavior. So it's clearly something that, that, that you see a, 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 a increasing complexity and it makes sense because we know from the music theory that uh, indeed uh, the palette of harmony is way richer in, in composition by Mahler than in Giuseppe de Pre. Um, and this actually corre it correlates with other measures uh, of uh, uh, cultural evolution of music. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, correlation that we find here between uh, a simple number that doesn't really, I mean, in principle, even mean anything, but that has this kind of uh, Yes? Have um, you looked at the complexity in terms of the number of players? No, 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 this is just harmonic complex, it's just chords. This is how the so chord's complexity you know, evolves. Box sitting in an organ, and two feet. Well, it's even less than that. It's four, <laughs> or five at most. Okay, I 
appointment, if that's taken into account, does this have lines to it, like how many players are allowed to play at the same time? It is, this is, I mean, that there are, I did some other studies using orchestration, and you can do these methods with, or, with looking at the orchestration of a particular piece, and look at how the different instrumental groups interact with each other. But the instrumental groups and the harmony are two distinct things, because one goes into the tambour aspect, so the way that you hear, and the effect that the, the combination of instrument has on your perception of an emotion of music, while here we are looking at an abstract representation of chords where there are at most four or five notes. A lot of those formulas and the network looks a lot like a neural network. Have you compared the results of your generator to a trained AI? Okay, AI? that's a complete, it, it's, a, it's <laughs> another talk. <laughs> <laughs> and then part two is could you use this model as an embedding Yes, I mean, both, both yes, uh, uh, it's, it's a little different, uh, and as I, I mean, I, I'm working on this, uh, I'm very interested in, uh, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I started all this was because I, I, I wanted to have a system, a compositional system that allowed me to create uh, or, or write music not influenced by my prior knowledge. Yeah. And so that's very good because it gives me all the, the, kind of the, the starting point for then composing on, on this framework, right? It's a system. Uh, and the same thing is true for, you know, the, the, the AI. And uh, it, clearly you can do the, a lot of things with, with, you know, you can embed, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can use uh, uh, the neural network that are trained on graphs. Uh, so there is a lot of work that one can, can do. But I, I, my primary uh, driver is uh, aesthetic and, uh, and, and yeah, composition. I was just wondering what you compare for the results. Uh, no, I, I don't have comparisons, but this is actually very, I mean, it's, diff it's not, it, it that doesn't have anything to do, uh, there is no uh, machine learning in this. Oh, yeah, no, I understand that. But yeah. Those formulas look like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Very good. What happens in the 20th century? <laughs> okay, I'll show you something here. So this is this is uh, this is a different kind of representation. I jump over a lot of slides. This is uh, a, a, a study done on the, the Spotify dataset. Uh, so Spotify uh, 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 has an API that allows you to download the chroma. That is a representation in terms. That is very similar in principle to the representation that I've been using in this uh, um, in, uh, for my networks. Huh? So basically, it tells me it, it's, a, it's an object like this that, that has uh, uh, different values uh, for the different pitches, the given probability of adding that pitch in that particular section of the music. So if you do that. Uh, 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 now you look at this, you have to look at this in, in the other direction. So if this measure complexity goes, I mean, the higher complexity goes down rather than up because it's a different measure that you're making. But what I want to do uh, 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 focus is this part here, when you have uh, Schoenberg before and after 1913. So in 1913, Schoenberg came up with the uh, 12 phone system of composition. And we have to start here. To there, <laughs> and it's a clear distribution of the two bits. So, so this uh, captures uh, also right, aspect, uh, aesthetical aspects of, of the music, uh, mm -hmm. uh, just with this kind of analysis. So to conclude, uh, a few references. Uh, so I, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a software developer also. So I mean, uh, all the, the results that you've seen here are obtained with this library in Python that I. I created and maintained. Um, these are in my websites. Uh, and these are some references uh, about papers that have been uh, published uh, in, in the past few years. So, happy long. I'll give you this slide, don't worry. What was it? Uh, like uh, 2020. Alien hunters detect mysterious radio signal from nearby star. Was that a dropped call from ET? 
Well, could have been that some alien were sending us music. Thank you. All of this data analysis is really interesting, but have you attempted to quantify the relationship between all these data sets and emotional states? No, not yet. Because, because, yeah. because yeah. music, obviously, yes. Yes. is an yes. emotional experience. So I'm curious how you were late. So not personally, but in the working group I was talking about we have at least a couple of people who are either psychologists or they study music cognition. And so there are, there is work done in this direction, but this is way too complicated for now. To and you'd also have to quantify emotional states. Yeah, but I mean, that, that, there are ways of doing this. There are ways of doing this. And there are experiments I mean, and music cognition. Uh, it's a, it's a field. Uh, like with uh, fMRI? Yeah, there was science. Uh, I mean, there, there are important people that have been doing very good work uh, huh. uh, in, in, in this direction. There are uh, a couple of names that come to mind, uh, Dr. Zatorre and Montreal. Uh, there is an issue of science uh, that came out like maybe 12 years ago or something that has a collection of articles that deal with the neuroscience music. There are very good books uh, that I can uh, um, there is this older, uh, it's called the psychology of music. There, is, uh, uh, there are two books. One is This Is Your Brain on Music. Levin, I think, is the last name. And then another one uh, that is broader, so it talks about music, but also about poetry and literature and, and uh, visual arts. And it's called uh, uh, Proust Was a Neuroscientist. <laughs> <laughs> I really recommend those books. Well, there is another one from uh, Oliver Sacks, uh, Musicophilia, that oh, yeah, is yeah. about uh, you know, music right. and neurological disorders. That is also very interesting. That's very good, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So um, your root optimization issue with uh, getting around the different nodes of the network, is that similar to the, like, the traveling salesman exactly. it, 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 that they're trying to solve yeah. the quantum computing? Which, so yeah. is, are any of your network using quantum computers? Yeah. I mean, I worked on quantum computing uh, yeah. on my science side. Uh, right. I was doing it for five years. It was a genius who did everything. I just put my name on. <laughs> <laughs> I know about quantum computing, but don't ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> Show me what it works. <laughs> so I can, oh, yeah. You made a statement earlier that I thought was kind of interesting because you were saying when you created your artificial version that was essentially tolerable, did you expect that maybe it was going to be atrocious and you weren't going to be able to listen to it? Well, I didn't expect anything. <laughs> <laughs> it just came out like that. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, in any you know, creative projects, you know, that you generate a lot of, a lot of stuff, <laughs> you, know, you draw, you, 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 you know, paint, you do stuff, and then you decide, oh, well, this one doesn't work, this one doesn't work. I'll show you this one. <laughs> well, I mean, it makes sense that Frank Zappa is very poor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hands down, but. <laughs> so it's just that, like, so Mozart's bar is, you know, a bit of a step up. Yeah, that's, and that's, I mean, that. that and Beethoven was just. No, like, it, yeah. Clearly, that, that, I, mean, I, I think that there is a, a, a clear distinction now. You see that these colors, these bars are very wide. Uh, yeah. and, and that's one of the problems with uh, uh, all the all computational musicology is that the data sets are very small. I mean, they are small because composers compose few pieces. Uh, 
right. but also because the, the many of these, uh, I mean, there, there are no good uh, uh, libraries of digitized scores that you can use for doing this wide studies. So you rely on MIDI that is that is made by people and put online, uh, or you know, it's 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 a very complex and, and there are there are many different representations and I wish so. Uh, this is something that goes into the AI question also. So we need to have a representation of all the things. Uh, uh, I have two questions that I would love for you to address. One, it has to do with how you see your life as a composer and a scientist and how, how those things are. And then the second is, would you mind telling us something about what you'll be showing? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think I'm very fortunate to have an institution, an institution that allows me to have a joint appointment in two different colleges and two different departments. Because I have a joint appointment between the composition division of the College of Science. Can you still use it? Oh, yeah, sorry. The, um, I have a uh, joint appointment with the composition division in the College of Music and the physics department in the College of Science. How these things talk to each other, uh, I mean, I've been uh, doing this forever. I started to study music when I was six, so way before I became a physicist, uh, and I always had uh, like these parallel lines. Uh, these parallel lines converged uh, uh, in the past 10, 15 years uh, more. Uh, because then I got in, involved. I mean, I start, I stopped performing, and I started composing more. And then uh, all this computational aspect is what binds together. Because at the end, uh, we use uh, computers in a way that, as I do, uh, computational materials. I do computational music. Cards. Okay. Um, I have some cards here with information. Mm -hmm. Guys. Um, uh, so the piece, uh, let me go back to the original thing here. Okay. okay, so this is a piece uh, uh, that is an actu actually is a, it's an immersive room installation, uh, video and music. It's a collaboration between uh, uh, myself, uh, Laszlo Barbasi, who is this network uh, uh, scientist I mentioned, uh, and uh, two amazing video artists uh, that work with Laszlo, Hans Mishchenko, and Gabor Kitzinger. Um, what you see here is not what you see in currents. This is a site specific, uh, it's, a, it's a version of this, but not the same. So, this is a site specific installation that we did uh, uh, last year in Milan for the um, a museum, a digital culture center, it's called Mint. Uh, it's, this particular installation was really specific because the room was very, I mean, there is only that room in the world. Huh? It's like <laughs> 20 yards by 10, 15 high resolution projectors, uh, 10 rows of six speakers, you can see the rows here. There's another row of speakers, and there's another row of speakers, another row of speakers. So you are immersed in this large, enormous place, um, and um, and you are immersed in this you know, kind of representation of networks, as you can see. So it's based on this idea of networks, and uh, um, this piece that evolved into the one that would be at Caverns, uh, there is still. Uh, and a site specific immersive installation is not as big because the room is not as big, but it's probably not wider than this one. It's probably you know, the door to here and then square around. Um, and uh, the, the piece is called La Solitudine delle Multitudini, it means the solitude of the multitudes. And uh, it kind of plays with this idea of connections between. Uh, Notes, people, notes, chords, actions, and uh, you are all invited. <laughs> <laughs>
So I have a, a short video, not of this, but of another piece that we did with the same people. That if you want, I can show you. It's just five minutes. Huh? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, this one is uh, uh, um, originally is a piece for. Um, was an actual uh, installation with uh, three-dimensional video, um, pepper ghosts. Mm. You know, it's like you project uh, on mirrors and then the image mm. slides itself. And it was done for an exhibition at the Ludwig Museum in Budapest, uh, November 2023. No, November 2022. Uh, from there, and this is actually an, an, an interactive installation, so the music, they are, the music and the video react to the position of the visitors to the, 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 the place. And there are videos on my website. Too. Then it was made into a video by myself uh, and uh, Gabor Kitzinger. Right now, this video is shown uh, as part of an exhibition in Sao Paulo, Brazil, on uh, um, the art. And, um, I'm showing you now here. Uh, unfortunately, the aspect ratio of the video is two to one with respect to the aspect ratio of the skin, so you see just a, 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 this stripe here. The, the data for the, of the necklace that you see are actually uh, real data from uh, um, uh, the Twitter network of COVID uh, disinformation that uh, uh, they were started by uh, the Barbasi group as a scientific project uh, that, um, where they identified uh, 12 uh, spread super spreaders uh, of this information. Mm. And in fact, uh, they call this uh, the uh, um, fake news episode. And uh, although you don't really see or hear uh, all the um, I mean, the structure of the network and also the soundscape, what you are hearing, is all manipulation of um, sounds based on uh, original tweets of uh, this particular network.